like you to come back. Good morning, good morning. You I have been see. just They're informed now. that Mr. Kacharovsky will missing us. I'm sorry about it, but the panel is very distinguished. Good morning. Uh, do we we'll still trust the media? This is the question I'm waking with every day and I have no answer yet. And we try probably the, to offer you some, some, some uh, answers, some uh, thinking about it. Uh, this is the very distinguished panel on the, my uh, left hand from your right uh, is sitting Mrs. Uh, Radichova, Iveta Radichova. She was the keynote speaker the first evening. Uh, Professor Radichova studies the Communist University in Bratislava, sociology, later in Oxford. And uh, after the revolution, 1992, she founded the Social Policy Analysis Center, NGO, in Bratislava. Later, in the 2006, she was appointed as a uh, director of the Institute of Sociology of the Academy of, of Sciences of Slovak Republic. In the same year, she entered the politics. She became a, a deputy of the Slovak Parliament. Uh, in the same year, I think uh, she became a minister of, of labor, uh, social, social affairs, affairs, and family mm -hmm. of Slovak Republic. And in the until then, he, he became a prime minister of Slovakia. Uh, the lady on my on my uh, right hand, from your point of view, left is Mrs. Wendelin von Brido. Uh, she's a journalist. Uh, she write she, she wrote for the for the uh, Wall Street Journal Europe. Uh, nowadays, she's the editor chief of the European section, or European edition of the, the Economist, and she's writing mostly about uh, Central Eastern Europe. Uh, on uh, my left, uh, the man is uh, Adrian Sarbu, born in Brasov. As I know now, is, uh, he lives in Prague, in London, in Bahamas, in Brasov, in Bucharest <laughs> as well. He studied the film at the, at the National uh, Academy of uh, Theatrical and Cinematographic Arts in Bucharest. Uh, during the, during the revolution in Romania, he was a member of the Salvation Front. Is it good? So good. And uh, in the first government of Romania, he was a state secretary for mass media. Thanks to him, the Romania had had a very good audiovisual law and cinematographer law, and this, uh, this law allowed the uh, uh, the private television and radios, and uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, the uh, very nice development of the Romanian cinematography. Later on, he became a president of the Pro TV, uh, the Romanian TV station, and uh, uh, then after that, uh, now is a president and CEO of the Central uh, European Media Enterprises. Uh, this is the probably the biggest private company in the Central Eastern Europe. You know probably you are familiar with Nova or Markiza in Slovakia. They are all stations uh, of the CME. And uh, quite on my, on my uh, left, the last gentleman is from Belarus. Uh, uh, he uh, is the youngest of us, as you probably can see. He studied at Belarus uh, State University, an expert. He was a founder and former chairman of the Belarusian Popular Front Youth Section. He's a fellow, a fellow. Uh, fellow. If I'm well informed, he was four times in prison. Yes. And uh, nowadays he works for the, uh, for the Belarusian section of RFE Radio Liberty in Prague. Well, uh, every day we received a plenty of information from from variety of media channels, TV, internet, radio, newspapers, or other print media. We are so overwhelming by this large number of information that we cannot distinguish facts from fiction, or we cannot assure ourselves opinions when 
we face the facts because of being confused by too many convinced opinion of these facts. What we can do? Professor Radichova. Hmm. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be among such audience. Uh, I have decided to have introduction in my Slovak language, as I love it, and it's my tongue language. And then discussion will be in English, so we can discuss among us directly. So it's not because of the knowledge, it's because of my proud to be Slovak. Uh, so once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm honored to have the opportunity from the first day to discuss in the spirit of Mr. Havel about democracy and its relation towards media. Do we trust media? That's the crucial question. And let me give you three comments. The crisis of trust as such. Second, overlapping of this crisis of trust to our relation to media. And number three, how do we handle facts? And that will open a discussion. So very briefly, people discuss a lot about the reason of the major crisis we are living through since 1909, uh, sorry, 2009. Let me summarize that. It's a crisis of confidence, crisis of trust, trust in our economic system, crisis of trust in financial institutions, trust in institutions of democracy, both at the national and above national levels. And the trust crisis, crisis of trust in solutions we are being supplied with. Recently, there was a research in 12 European countries made, and I'm going to summarize the viewpoints of citizens of these 12 countries in one sentence. The economists do not know, mass media doesn't know, politicians doesn't know what, do not know what to do, so what should we do? People are in doubt, and at the moment when a solution is provided, it's attacked immediately and taken into doubt. The overall crisis of trust is being reflected in, in the very basics of democracy. And I'm speaking about information without access to information. There won't be any civil participation. There won't be any democracy. We are living in a time of globalization. You were discussing for two days the amount of information we are getting. So the first step, how do we choose from among all those facts and information what angle we should adopt? what's of substance and what's not. At the moment of choice of a fact, I'm creating actually the public opinion. Let me give an example from yesterday. If you open the monitoring built-in, the printed part, now I'm not speaking about electronic media. These are two different worlds, worlds apart, as my colleague, Mr. Sarbu, can confirm these are two worlds apart. So in Slovakia, at the moment, there are two pieces of information about Forum 2000. Number one could be found at the Pravda Daily, and it's been adopted from the Czech press agency as a whole, just a material, substantial information. Prouder Daily is issued in a very low number of copies. It's number four 
among dailies in Slovakia. And then there is the second piece of information. Let me quote. Havel was in the service of Satan as Klaus advisor claims. So this is the article in the most read daily in Slovakia as one of the crucial news in this daily. So my question is, who decided about the choice of information? My question is, what was behind this choice of information? And I claim that if the most widely read daily in Slovakia brought at least one sentence about how this in conference is being carried out. And there might be an article expressing the opposite view. There might be these two streams of information created. However, there was a single article only. And if I look at the media from this angle. There are three new principles. Number one, speed. During the day, it's necessary to process tremendous amount of information. From the morning till the very last minutes of the day. And it's also necessary to write an article or perhaps to go to the field with the intention of getting a feedback for the interview. So the investigative journalist had disappeared. Principle number two, a form. It's much more important what the headline is, what picture is accompanying the article. It's more important than the content. I'm picking up to Mr. Williams from yesterday's night and his presentation when he has uttered a sentence. It's not that important today what we are saying in terms of content, but who is giving you the content and how. So we are speaking more about form and personification. It's more important than the content and the guest of the information. And the principle number three, the principle of commercialization of the public sphere. The politician is goods. And the, the TV channel, if you don't like it, we simply switch, simply switch. Values are goods as well, because we can swap it if someone is offering us news on a different career. Mass media are processing these information using the angle of, is this news successful? with the reader or not? Is it easy to sell? And public and private media are competing in the area of commercial usage, even if they are funded from public resources. They are funded from public resources with the aim of not having to compete, with the aim of creating alternative space. The citizen is not a rocking horse. The citizen shouldn't have the intelligent quotient of the rocking horse who could be fed any information. The principle of commercial usage leads to the fact that program structures have absolutely similar structure reality show are the same everywhere in the world. Other type of show, it's the same everywhere. TV commercials are the same everywhere, so there is no escape. 
there is no choice. Only the only escape is a decent public private media. The same division goes for printed media where weeklies, expert weeklies are maintaining the status of independent mass media. Economist, Financial Times, Wall Street and other journals who maintain the quality of the content versus the tabloids and tabloidization of dailies who formerly brought valuable content. They are losing it and they are competing with tabloids. Mass media have a tremendous power. They are offering one topic after another and the citizen is confused. He is no longer secure and there is one more consequence apart from the lack of security. Politics and solutions are getting wider and wider apart from the citizen. Let me give you yet another example because I have my colleague here, so I'm going to use the example from the TV Markiza from the Slovak Republic. You in the Czech Republic will enter the president election campaign. For the first time in history, there will be a direct election of the president. I've already gained this experience and I'm um, not so self-conscious to be able to compare those duels on the screen like Obama and his opponents. But the citizen has a right to make a decision based on what he sees on the screen. And I believe that during the direct election of the president, the last decisive sort of duel in Slovakia was President Gasparovich versus the citizen Iveta Radicheva. That was on TV Markiza. At the beginning, there was a cutout from one interview with me, totally manipulated and false. And my friends, for several seconds, I just froze. In the first second, I didn't know how to respond. And I was defensive for the rest of the interview because I was forced to explain what was it in that cutout interview. And my partner was smiling nicely, but I wasn't that content. However, I had to cope with a smiling face with the whole interview. I'd rather get up and leave. But, you know, after the election, the Council for Broadcasting and Transmission, whose task is to monitor correctness of interviews, had reprimanded Marquisa TV. Well, and they said, I'm sorry, but my friends, it was long after elections. What Marquisa did was a manipulation and I asked who provided you with that interview, edited interview, and they told me, well, we'll spare you this, you know, fact. Why would you like to know? What counts is that it was broadcast, this edited interview with me. So mass media has a tremendous influence and tremendous power, and they decide about the election results. They decide about citizens and their capability of managing public affairs. And their main responsibility is in the choice of information and systemization of facts. If they are not able to cope with that, then we live in artificially created reality, which will be coming further apart from the real world. Thank you for the attention.
Professor Rajeshava began this thesis, there's a crisis of confidence, so who can we trust? Uh, I read that a year ago, a uh, not very old study, research about the situation in the United States. This research was made concerning the form of the media and just a bit content. And there are some figures I will not comment by. The, the percentage of confidence is most, is, they are the stock and industry analyzed reports. Articles in business magazine, 44%. This stock and industry analysis report, 49% of the confidence. News coverage on the radio, 38%. News coverage in television, 36%. Newspaper articles, 34%. Corporate communication, 32%. Social networks, 19%. And corporate or product advertising, just 17%. Adrian, what do you mean about this 36% TV news coverage? Is a similar situation in Europe? Or what's your opinion on that? Why so low? Why so high? I don't know. I can tell you that in uh, our countries, <clears throat> the confidence in news exceeds 50% in television. These are studies. But I'll come back to this. Uh, Mrs. Radicheva spoke about the crisis in which we are, we feel. Uh, financial gurus don't know which is a receipt. Politicians don't have a solution. Neither mass media has a solution. So we have a saying in my country, only God knows. The small problem is that if we do a poll now, and you're a specialist in this, we may discover that less people believe in God than believe in television and in mass media. So uh, we are dealing with people, individuals, communities, which we have to accept the they believe more in media, especially television, than in God. I'm sure that in Czech Republic this happened, because I, I know the statistics. So uh, this is a fact. So my answer to your question, which is the headline, is yes, we should trust media. Because we have no choice. But media today is not what with we are accustomed to to see years ago when i had the chance to start free media after 1990 in romania we started with thousand newspapers and no pub, no commercial television then we have probably 10 newspapers 10 magazines 50 tv channels and five million, five million Romanians, especially young people, navigating on net, looking for information every single day. So today media is mostly internet. It's a combination of internet, mobile, with television and fixed internet. And at the end of the day, it will be a simple mobile media. So. Uh, I'm trying in such a way to answer to your frustration, which you felt when you saw just an article in, uh, in that newspaper in Slovakia. Probably not the best people now are writing in newspapers. Probably even those ones who write in newspapers are more, more accustomed with a new way of expressing into internet, which is most li mostly headlines and probably i'm not i'm not trying to defend that article obviously you're right probably they feel responsible for their viewers or readers or users and they know that today what you call tabloid we call entertainment today the content of media it's mostly entertainment 
and very few information. And I think we are here not to discuss about entertainment, but we have to accept that what we see, the role in media, is mostly in communicating true information uh, done by honest professionals. But media generally, it's mostly the, the, an environment of entertainment when even information became entertainment. Uh, Mr. Mates was speaking about uh, America. In America, the most powerful news channels are purely entertainment channels. Fox News is a news channel covering the whole country, is more powerful than any news program in, uh, in any uh, American network. So coming back, my invitation is, let's be relaxed, let's trust in media. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if we do not trust media and do not, do not trust God, then let's think of uh, one of our real gods, which was John, John Lennon, who said, let's believe in ourselves. And if we can start from believing in ourselves, we can start believing in our capacity to communicate through the most democratic and the most, the broadest uh, medium which exists as which is internet. Today is different than 10 years ago, is different than five years ago, and I see that it's forever different. And what is different is that any individual can express herself or himself, and the big media companies, the Uh, the evil media companies, the gatekeepers of information in the world are less and less powerful and we individuals are more and more powerful. That is my main thought to answer to you. And if the question was how influential are the news in television in our countries, I can tell you, the public television news have a very low influence. Why? Exactly because uh, of the reason Mrs. Radicheva uh, remarked, the public, the public television don't do the public service. The public television suffer a complex of inferiority and they are trying to compete with public money, with our money, commercial televisions, which commercial televisions are not aimed to do, to deal with information, but with entertainment. So uh, the least credible are the public news. You can, you can see the measurement. The most credible are the television news of the bigger networks, the bigger TV stations. Now we can, we can go here and talk about what happened with Marquisa. For me, it's a surprise, as it was for you when you found that uh, story. For me, it's a surprise finding out about story. So about that, that event in your life related to one of our stations. In the meantime, probably you know the general director of Marquisa of those days. Now he's a general director of public television in Slovakia. So I don't yes, know how true. that this happened. That's true. That's true. I can't tell you why, why is he not the, the general director of Marquis. But <laughs> I cannot tell you. So, uh, we like or we don't like people believe in media, trust in media, and uh, public uh, news, news programs, especially in commercial stations, driven by the huge, huge power of entertainment, are very trustful. I don't say, I don't say the information which is communicated through these channels is always pure, is generally mixed with entertainment. And we have to accept we live in this world where everything needs to be entertainment in order to be, to be attractive. That's my answer. Uh, 
I don't know if you are allowed to answer my question, of course. Concerning the ratings, uh, you are absolutely right. Do you plan any research of credibility of the TV cover, uh, the news coverage in, in uh, your stations? We do, we do monthly. Yeah? Monthly. And I tell you, we like or we don't like the commercial stations, the main commercial stations in all our countries are the most credible media in these countries. And the news programs are the most credible, even if they are a little bit too tabloid. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, because I would like to mention another research for the very respectable uh, organization, Gallup, uh, concerning, again, the United States. The majority of Americans still do not have confidence in the mass media to report the news fully, accurately, and fairly. The Gallup found 55% of Americans have a little or no trust in the media, while 44% of Americans have a great deal or fair amount of trust. Do you mean the situation in Central East in Europe, in Europe is the similar? Sorry, do I mean the situation is, can you just repeat your question? The situation is, as in the United States, it means the, 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 the credibility, the confidence. Yeah, do, do I think I'm... Um, yeah, speaking again and again about the confidence, about the trust. Um, I don't know enough yet about Central and Eastern Europe because I'm just starting uh, <laughs> to cover it, to, to give um, an apodictic um, uh, statement. So I think I will wait <laughs> before I decide um, um, and make a blanket statement about the media in this um, region. Um, I wanted to maybe start talking about why it is so um, important um, to trust the media. Um, we've talked a lot about the traditional um, role of the media yesterday, and we see, said, you know, it's holding authority accountable. And we journalists like to think of ourselves as the fourth estate and the purveyor of truth and the standard bearer of public ethics. But um, we are also in the business of grabbing your attention. And we are in the business of grabbing your attention in an increasingly competitive world. And it seems more difficult and increasingly difficult to, to do both. And it's a very fine line that, that most media outlets have to find and have to tread. Um, so I'm trying, I'll try to be a bit of a devil devil's advocate and say, well, actually, I think we shouldn't really trust the media anymore. And I'm talking, I know Western Europe, as I just started to cover Eastern and Central Europe, I know Western Europe a little bit better, so I'll talk a bit more about Western Europe. Um, first of all, the commercial constraints for the media have increased. You can see in nearly all Western European countries, you can see the... Um, ownership of the media is increasingly concentrated. Um, you have mostly corporation uh, controlling the media, newspapers, but also television. Particularly blatant example is Italy, um, where when Berlusconi, Silvio Berlusconi was still prime minister, he um, controlled state TV, obviously, he controlled private TV, he controlled a major newspaper, and he controlled a, a major publishing house. And Italy is a Western democracy where you think um, it, it should be one of the most advanced in terms of a free and fair media. Um, in France, it's not that different by now. You have a defense company controlling Le Figaro. You have um, a, a luxury goods tycoon controlling the biggest business news daily. Again, you have very few truly independent newspapers in France. Then, and we have talked a lot about this in the last week, there's so much stuff out there that I, I think as a um, media consumer, I don't blame anybody to be utterly confused and not to really know where to go uh, anymore. There's so much availability of information. Then, of course, journalists are selective by nature. We all know that. Um, they are partisan. All, nearly all uh, news organizations have a certain political bent. Many people here seem to be um, following Fox News for some reason. Over the last two days, I heard a lot about Fox News and, and what people think about it, which is not very much often. <laughs> um, and of course, journalists make mistakes. You know, they nobody like like everybody else. Um, we can. 
But trust is important, and we can see it how very venerable news organizations react um, very defensively and very anxiously when their reputation is damaged. So um, you can see at the moment there's a big um, scandal in, in Britain with the, um, the BBC and Jimmy's, Jimmy Savile. I mean, it used to be an, a small investigation and now it's become a criminal inquiry and it seems to grow by the day. A few years ago, I don't know whether you remember, there was a big um, scandal in the New York Times with a journalist called Jason Blair who seemed to be plagiarizing most of his copy and that really upset uh, people because the New York Times has this fantastic reputation of um, not only accuracy but also very high journalistic um, standards. So I give you now lots of reasons why we shouldn't trust or should be very careful not to trust the media. But then on the other hand, in this new era, and I think we really see a, a shifting of tectonic plates in the media landscape, I think there are lots of reasons in some way to be optimistic. In, we live in an era of unprecedented democracy in the media. We see increasingly the phenomenon of citizen journalists, of people doing their blogs, putting up their videos. Um, and for us as a media organization, we see that people, and not only young people, people of any age, are increasingly media savvy. And they want control over the media rather than be controlled by the media, and they increasingly have the means and the tools to do so. Um, and I think in that new landscape, it is more important, and that is of course a bit self-serving, but to, to, to maybe choose for yourself, and that's an individual decision, which media you trust most and which media you read or watch on a regular basis. Um, I mean, I can mainly speak of our, about ourselves, about The Economist, and we do make a huge effort to, um, we have almost an obsessive attention to accuracy and to, we have a whole team of fact checkers and they, they persecute you on press night to really show all your sources and they double check the reports because even if you say, well, I've had it from this report, of course you can have misread things. So we try our best, but obviously it's, uh, it's never perfect. Um, so I think to conclude, I'd say we should never blindly trust the media. Um, and we should use this opportunity to, to take, to be in charge. And I think that's, that's an opportunity for all of us. Um, yesterday, somebody asked me, um, can there be a true democracy without free media? Uh, it was a gentleman from Iran. And I think the, the answer is obvious. The answer is obviously not. So however imperfect and however confusing the media are today, I think the media play an essential part in democracy. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh I'm, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I have to pat a following question concerning the BBC, because really the BBC is for many of us the fortress of confidence. What about the last scandal? Do you mean is the end of some era? No, I don't think so. I think, I think this is a, a, a very serious story and a, and a very serious incident and visibly people have, it, there were rumors and they've been ignored or covered up and, and that's not a good thing and eventually maybe some people will have to go as a consequence. But I don't think there'll be a lasting damage on the BBC. I think the BBC will will survive and go hopefully from strength to strength. But it is, um, it, it shows that in that era, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, it was actually easier to just put things under the carpet mm. because you didn't have the citizen journalism and you didn't have you didn't have the transparency you have mm. today. So I really think today that scandal would not. Did, uh, whatever he did would not have been possible. So in that it actually shows you how our current era is an opportunity yeah. and an advantage. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, the boss last speaker said to you that we could trust media. Uh, another opinion from the world uh, that says that the only institution to allow trust around the globe is media. Over the last three years, trust in the media has fallen from the 48 to 45 percent among all the informed publics. 
With this person of traditional media authority and the rise of open journalism, trust in the institution as a whole was waned. What do you mean, Franek? You are, have a view from just different part of Europe. You lived, if I'm very informed, in exile in Vilnius? No, 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 no. no? Uh, I live in Belarus, of course, yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. So. I live in Belarus, and I would like to change a little bit the geography of our, of our discussion, because we are speaking all the time about Western uh, countries, free societies. But the first time globally now. <laughs> uh, yes, in global sense, but Václav Havel, for example, he was aware about non-free societies, about transition in that, in, in that countries. Uh, as uh, Professor Rad Radishova said during the first opening session, she said one of the sources of the current democratic deficit is the mediification of politics. It's absolutely right. And I will add it's and politization of media the same time. And I would like to speak about a very important problem, not just for a free society, by, but, but also for non-free countries. Uh, advocacy political advocacy and journalism. Where is a border? What is the difference? Why and how journalists can be lobbyists of politicians? And I would like to divide, to separate countries on three groups. There are free societies, which we were discussing before, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Great Britain, USA as well. Free societies, of course, there are medias closer to this political force, closer to that one. There are partly free societies and there are non-free countries. And I would like to speak about second uh, and third uh, groups of countries. Belarus, Belarus is my country, it is not far away from here. You can just uh, fly there, be there in one hour and a half. Uh, Belarus is a partly free, uh, in media uh, sense, country. Why partly free? Because medias, are formally independent of the government, are formally independent from the, of the politics. But sometimes politicians, authorities, make media oppositionists. You know, in my, in my, for example, I am a student, I was a student of journalism, a faculty of journalism. I was writing articles, I was a, not simple, but journalism, but it doesn't uh, help, it doesn't save me from arrests. So, Four times I was arrested for organizations of different manifestations, actions, just because I've participated in, in these actions. Uh, do you know, I think my colleagues uh, or uh, participants of discussion, they remember Soviet, uh, how to say, not Soviet time, but yeah, the times of Soviet empire. And in every country there was a newspaper, one, one newspaper. In uh, Rude Pravo in uh, Czechoslovakia, Pravda in Slovakia, Tribuna Luda in Poland, and others. Now in Belarus, there is going, we see the process, which I can name like neo sovietization Oh no, it's better to say arrest sovietization mm -hmm. It's not just specially for Belarus. It is, uh, it is very, very um, symbolic. It's um, the same in all countries to the east of Poland, to the east of European Union. You see also the processes in, uh, uh, in Ukraine, in Caucasus states. Uh, in Belarus, October the 1st, Belarusian government, dictator Lukashenko, I wouldn't like to mention, to, to name him president, uh, dictator Lukashenko unified all newspapers in only one. Soviet Belarus, Belarus today. Unified, one newspaper, half of the million uh, circulation, which be distributed all over the Belarus. The same is going on with state TV channels. Finances, uh, to these state TV channels, to these uh, newspapers, are going from the state budget. And of course, independent medias, medias uh, um, created by Belarusian citizens or broadcasting uh, from abroad, like Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, or Belsat TV from Poland, they are not able to concurrent. Just example by finances, like state controlling by finances medias. State TV, Belarusian TV, they are getting 53 millions of donation of finances every year, plus advertisement, income from advertisement. Belsat TV, which broadcasts from Poland, uh, 
has only six million dollars, you know, for all the year and no advertisement. What does it mean? That independent TV channels, the same as independent newspapers, are not able absolutely to be concurrent, to, keep, to compete with the state, uh, with state medias. Also, I would like to tell about, um, about attitude of government toward medias. Lukashenko, dictator of Belarus, who is uh, positively, how many times positively mentioned Adolf Hitler uh, in his um, speeches. Uh, now he can use slogan, one people, one nation, one leader, and one newspaper. Uh, really, when the uh, Belarus government engaged with the media, it routinely uses the language of war. Speaking in Belarusian State University, where I was studying, and after that was ex expelling um, for my political and journalism activities, he said, media hold the weapon of a most destructive power. They must be controlled by the state, Lukashenko told to a group of journalism students at the university. And you see, here we have another problem of these non-free societies. Where is the border between propaganda, propaganda and real journalism, you know? And the most harsh thing is harassments of journalists. Just example, few days before elections, one month ago, the journalist, photographer of Associated Press, Sergei Hritz, he was harshly, harshly beaten by police when he was filming, when he was making photo of the oppositional action, and he was arrested, and he was bleeding after it. Anton Surapin, 20 years old photographer, who, who just published photos in his own personal blog, photos of Teddy Beers, Teddy Beers, which was, uh, how to say, airdropped by Swedish human rights defender to Belarus, he was detained by Lukashenko security services and spent more than one month in the prison just because he published photos in the blog. How we can tell about independence of medias in this situation? All of the majority of my colleagues and the majority of you remembering, you know, Soviet times, 68, you know, and the same processes uh, are, going now, are going on now in Belarus. And foreign free medias. Now, I'm working for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, you know. We remember, maybe the majority of, of you remember as a media that helped, that brought democracy to your countries. Now in Belarus, Radio Liberty is needed as never. It plays the same role it was playing during Cold War in 60s, 70s, 80s. And government took, is taking journalists of independent media, of Bielsat, of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Radio Razia, the same as oppositionists. And very often we see as journalists are playing more important role and sometimes are harshly more more seriously repressed, suppressed, and threatened as, as, as opposition. And in that case, I see, uh, I see the solution. I see the solution how to avoid these problems, you know, how to resolve these problems. Uh, first of all, to use new media. Of course, it's a topic for um, another discussion. How to use social media, social networks. I think that citizen journalism, you know, for example, in the case of non-free or partly free societies, it's a solution, you know, how to avoid this discrimination, these repressions provided by authoritarian governments uh, on the example of Belarus. Thank you for that. Uh, it... It could be interesting to know uh, more about it. Uh, how is the access in Belarus to the foreign media? Or uh, you mentioned you are working for RFE. You mentioned the, the station, the TV station broadcasting on phone. How is the access really? Uh, what about the access uh, to internet? Is it absolutely free or? Uh, yesterday, uh, there was a discussion during Forum 2000 about social media in Belarus, and we decided that social media is like a panacea, you know, for Belarusian uh, civil society. Uh, half of Belarusian 
has access to internet. But as you mentioned, they use an internet for entertainment. And it's very difficult, it's very difficult to engage people to make them interest to politics. What is going on in their countries and in countries uh, abroad, uh, foreign countries, you know? So they have access to a uh, state newspaper, which is everywhere. They don't have access to foreign medias at all, only by websites, by websites, you know? But they don't know how to find them. They don't, usually they don't know foreign languages, you know? And this all creates this barrier, you know? in building contacts with foreign countries. And that's why between Belarus, Ukraine, there is a Chinese wall, informational, Chinese and cultural as well, wall, which we together, I hope, should worry. Yeah, yeah. Professor Radish, of course. Mm, only, only short comment, yes. Uh, you are absolutely right that we didn't distinguish in between different situations in the countries concerning democracy. Looking uh, around uh, in Europe, at least we have five different uh, groups of countries. First group are countries with so-called consolidated mm -hmm. democracies like, for example, Baltic states, and some where are a bit problems like, for example, Hungary. Then second group are uh, groups of the countries, so-called quasi-democratic or pseudo-democratic. Mm -hmm. uh, Albania, Macedonia, Moldavia, Slovakia was in this group in 1993 till 1998. A very well known uh, era of Mechiarism. Third group are so-called hybrid regimes called also uh, com Competitive autocracies like Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, Kyrgyzia. Fourth group uh, are countries with consolidated autocracy, not a democracy, like Belarus, Russia, Azerbaijan, Tajikistan. And fifth group are countries where they use democratic words and rhetoric but they never have started to do something with democracy, really, like Uzbekistan, Turkmenia, Kazakhstan. And another part we have to say of democratization uh, process are uh, Arabian states, mm -hmm. uh, so-called Arabi Arabian Spring, and as uh, in Egypt, there is also the name of these changes like Facebook revolution. Uh, because elite was communicated through Facebook networking uh, and in newspapers there was uh, information that one parent uh, decided to give the name Facebook to his daughter. Yeah. <laughs> Whole Egypt was discussing if it's okay to give the name to the daughter, Facebook, but uh, what was on another side of this entertainment and this kind of information was that everybody started to know that, that something going on on Facebook. Something is organized on Facebook. And uh, paradoxically, it was 32,000 people connected. If you compare that Egypt officially uh, has, as I remember it correctly, 82 million people. So this small group, but good organized, mm -hmm. started uh, the change, really democratic change uh, in Egypt. Uh, yes, before in Tunisia with this tra tragedy. But still, it's totally another kind of democratization because they have to talk what about army, what's the position of army, etc., etc. And it will never be like our uh, Sartori liberal kind of democracy. Yeah. So we have something. We have something because of our history, and it's not easy. Uh, linear, uh, it, it is never. Uh, after the split, velvet divorce of Czechoslovakia in Slovakia, the price was so high because of this pseudo-democratic regime. 
uh, and we have to restart whole democracy in, in Slovak Republic. So without, without everyday participation, for example, on Facebook, with entertainment like the name for the daughter called Facebook, uh, we will have no further chance to keep and to promote democracy. And second point, belief and truth are not the same. Mm -hmm. So true. if there is a confidence or trust to the media, it doesn't mean that this is the confidence towards the truth. Uh, so be very careful <laughs> and have in the mind this very important distinguish in between, on one side, confidence to somebody or something, and really the truth about somebody and something. This I would like to stress, and if you use the figures, it doesn't mean that the people really believe to the truth. The truth, the truth. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have to ask Frank for reaction because it's on, on Professor Radichova, what do you mean? Is it any chance to, or, the, or the internet or Facebook in Belarus, not just <coughs> entertaining sense you mentioned? Actually, I absolutely agree that Facebook, uh, social networks in Belarus, in case of contact, yeah? it's a Russian speaking social network, the same as Facebook, they really can substitute, partly substitute uh, normal classic media, you know. But anyway, for example, at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, now we have a problem because more and more people, people up to 35 years old, they don't uh, use classic, they don't read, they don't listen to classic media, you know. And anyway, in Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, now, sometimes more often working with <laughs> new media, with Facebook, than just with uh, a classic air, on air uh, broadcasting, you know. So it means that um, it's only way in Belarus, it's only one place like battlefield. It's media informational battlefield now for democracy in Belarus, Facebook. And I trust a lot in development of these media. And our main target is to reach people to make them interest uh, in political activities, in politics, as you mentioned in the opening, you know, to be interested in the real, in the truth, you know what is going on in uh, uh, in, uh, in the country, and as uh, yesterday, uh, some, somebody mentioned the slogan of Havel. You know, uh, truth. How, how to say? Believe in truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pravda zvitezhi, you know? I think it can be also used. Um, I just yes, idea. on the question only is when. When, but it's a very very good idea, you know, for in for internet, new yeah. media yeah. campaigning for distribution of independent information in Belarus. Just, we have to do, we have to take it for use. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Frank. Adrian, what do you mean about the role of new media, about the internet, about the influence of the media? Uh, it is strongly limited. There is a list of black list, uh, there is a list of black, um, black list of the sites forbidden in Belarus, formally. Really? Yeah, it's 80 websites officially by administration of president <laughs> accepted. 80 websites uh, with pornographic uh, materials, uh -huh. and 80 of them are political, uh, uh, in political information, uh, Charter 97, uh, independent media, uh, as well Radio Svoboda, and they are very often blocked during big campaigns, electoral campaigns, uh, street manifestations. But we are trying to use uh, anonymizers and uh, different ways how to avoid this mm -hmm. blocking. Uh, Adrian, the CME is involved in new media, of course. Uh, what do you mean about the role of the internet, about the new media? Just entertaining or some, some informational role? I shouldn't say here, but... Yes, of course. All, uh, all media, including television, are melting into internet. And uh, I see just benefits. I see just enlargement. I see just broader... Uh, broader opportunities for everybody to express and we have to accept and I'm coming back to to your uh, mm. data the more democracy in media the less trust in one medium mm. yeah and uh, unfortunately the, the, the diversities will come yeah and so we have to accept 
that trust, trust in one medium is reversed by the development or the, the enlargement of, of access to information. And coming back to information, we used new media initially mostly for information, for news, news channels. We have news channels, linear channels and news sites. Because we noticed during the last years something which you may like uh, listening now, that entertainment is not enough to keep people confident in, in your message. And we noticed that the, what was seen initially, the a mainstream audience, a quite compact audience, becomes more and more fragmented. And in fact today, when we speak about media, we speak about various, various media. And news are mostly, mostly driven through new media and through mobile new media. Now, newspapers are dead. The only newspapers which survive as brands are those ones who have a strong new media presence. Television in uh, what means news gathering and news distribution will scale down and this will go more and more into internet. And in one moment in time, we'll have one billion uh, bloggers, which may mean one billion newspapers, one billion news sites, and nobody will believe other than in himself. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the beauty of what we want to, uh, that's the beauty of democratization. And I, I was feeling extremely emotional when I heard my colleague about his life in, uh, in Belarus. I think we should, we should continuously not forget that there are people around us, near us, who suffer as we did. And now we have the luxury to talk about democratization, media, commercial media, public media, but there are people who even cannot express themselves in a country which is 1,000 kilometers from here. This is bad. Yeah. Thank you. I'm afraid we have a last uh, 15 minutes. I have opened the floor for a question. Is a, is a micro here somewhere? Thank you. C can Hello. Can you, can you introduce yourself at the first? Um, my name is Jakub Drapal, and I study law here in Prague at Charles University. And I would like to ask you a practical, practical question. Uh, as I would like to, I would like to ask, especially Wendelin von Bren Bredo and Franak uh, Vachorka, uh, but all of the panelists as well. Uh, how would you choose uh, media in which you would trust? If you would be, let's say, an ordinary citizen and you would have 20 minutes a day, would you rather concentrate uh, on one media and read it uh, thoroughly, or uh, would you uh, watch once a week uh, BBC, Al Jazeera, uh, national newspapers and such? So, so uh, imagine you're, uh, you're an ordinary citizen and how would you deal with your trust in the media? You. Uh, you mentioned the frantic first. I would ask you, and then probably you and then. Uh, <laughs> uh, if I will imagine that I am a simple citizen of uh, Belarus, I will not anyone, uh, no one of media you mentioned, you know, because a uh, simple citizen of Belarus, they know Soviet Belarus, they know uh, Zvezda, it means star, they know. Uh, but uh, Belarusian television one, Belarusian television two, and they know Alexander Lukashenko, which is everywhere. And um, but if, for example, we will uh, imagine that I am not just a simple citizen in a village, and I know different media, so of course I will trust to. Um, uh, to, to professional journalist medias, you know. But anyway, I don't see, and it's very pity, I don't see a big future, a long-term future in uh, professional journalist uh, medias because, as you see, this social, uh, civil journalism medias, they are developing very, very, very fast and successfully. And I think that with time, even, even professional medias, they will, they will, um, they will perform 
into civil journalism uh, projects uh, with, um, with user-generated content uh, as the majority of content of these uh, medias. I, I, only only this, it, I see the future of these uh, medias. And of course I will trust, uh, uh, I will trust the sources where I, will can, where I will be able to listen to uh, different points of view. In Belarus it's impossible. There is no one media that I, that I can uh, hear different opinions. Um, I think you said if you only have 20 minutes a day, should you just... Um, I would focus on, on, on the media or the newspaper you trust and, and, and read that carefully rather than try to read a or, or listen to about 20 um, and just skip um, because I think there's there's a danger that we just skip on the surface because there's so much out there and I think there's there's really an argument to read a few things in depth and even if that means you have only read two editorials and and three articles per day because you don't have so much time I think that's actually more productive than trying to just get snippets in 20 minutes of uh, 25 uh, sources so I, I th that's what I personally do too when I have very little time uh, yeah. I don't know if I do it correctly but I do it <laughs> uh, such I will open it and you can have a look from domestic information, governmental, direct governmental decisions, not comments, not informations in media, but concrete programs and laws mm -hmm. accepted by government mm -hmm. and then by parliament. No comments, no interpretation from media, concrete directly concrete decision mm -hmm. from government and national parliament concerning for uh, then i have a list of medias and do it very quickly during three minutes what they found uh, inside these materials and what absolutely not uh, and then i have a look on the commentaries and then it's time for jokes <laughs> Uh, so, first of all, resources, direct resources concerning domestic situation and concerning foreign situation, sure, I will not read commentary of uh, medias on uh, discussion Romney-Obama, I, I, I saw it and it's enough for me. Uh, and other situations, what's going on in foreign policy, yes, there is more or less trust, but in combination of medias, BBC, CNN, so very well known uh, medias, and to be very correct, and not because I'm in Prague, you're 24 on Chete. Mm -hmm. And this combination for foreign situation. May, may I ask you, do you buy the paper newspaper still? No, not. Uh, I prefer to have in the hand... <laughs> paper. <laughs> uh, I'm very conservative, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. But it's so different if the article is on the first page or somewhere inside. It's so different how uh, the title looks like, what kind of photography, uh, what there is, how, what, with, what is, it is combined in the structure of, of the page. So it works then with emotions and I would like to understand what kind of emotion is created in the society. And this you can know if you have a look on what people are looking on and how the combination of different things uh, uh, is done. Um, but then the time to read really something interesting is very small <laughs> and very short. So To, to uh, find it is, is short. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so openly when there is some very interesting topic like Forum 2000, so you ha can have monitoring immediately from internet and then I have a look on all, all outcomes 
uh, they are around. That's why I was able and prepared to say what I have said in introduction on monitoring uh, yeah. of information on Forum 2000. I'm sorry, I don't know if it's correct. May I ask you if you are buying the paper, newspaper still? Young gentleman. Well, since I'm still living with my parents, they do. They do. <laughs> yeah, he used the advert. Uh, for example, uh, Ignaz has an international magazine of economical yeah. person aspects. Sorry, the ones I buy and I. And what about television channels? You you do not. <laughs> <laughs> next, next, Look at him, yes, he's smiling, so <laughs> it's uh, clear uh, what he's reading. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> I have, a, of course, students, they, they, they agree with you, they're saying the same. I, they, we don't follow, they, they won't watch TV, but in fact, they watch TV here. But it's not the TV screen for them. <laughs> next question, please. And we have, we have not the other, they are not in the ratings, no? They are. Yeah. They are in the in the, in the new in, one. In the new media yeah, measure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They are. Mm -hmm. More accurate. More accurate. <laughs> Next question, please. No. Okay. That's a lady. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, You're Bruce Kahnweiser. I'm a freelance journalist here in Prague, and for three of the p past four years, I've also taught um, a class actually called Media and Democracy at an English language university here. I want to just comment briefly, if I could, on uh, the question of objectivity. Uh, one of the things we discussed in my class is, is it obtainable and should we strive for it? Um, I'd first say that you know, there's a difference of opinion between America and Europe. In America, journalists are generally taught to strive for objectivity. That's considered the gold standard. Many in Europe, I think in Britain and France in general, uh, they think objectivity is not necessarily, isn't achievable, and why not just uh, go forward and present uh, the news from a sort of partisan perspective. Uh, I think the truth is that, first of all, if you're striving for objectivity, um, it's impossible in a pure sense because, first and foremost, the viewers, the receivers, the, the listeners are themselves subjective. Everybody comes to the news with their own preconceived notions of how the world should be and what they want to hear. Secondly, of course, the journalists themselves are not robots, and they also have their preconceived notions of how the world should be. So in a pure sense, objectivity probably isn't obtainable. But I think in a professional sense, you can strive for objectivity by making an honest effort to present both sides or more than both sides of a story. And indeed, I would also say that I would argue that uh, the distinction between Fox News in America and the other networks isn't that um, one is right or wrong because of their political view. Fox News, I think, openly um, they basically shill for the Republican Party. Their agenda is not to create, uh, to present a, an objective opinion. Their objective is to create a conservative view that their people with conservative viewpoints will find comforting. The other networks and most of the news media in America, they strive for objectivity on the premise that object that what they're trading in is information, and the value of information that is honest, that is accurate, is what they're trying to sell. So I think those are a couple of distinctions that should be made in considering uh, the issues of, of objectivity. Thank you. Thank you. And the question is? <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't was really a comment. question. I really just wanted to comment. If anyone else wants to yeah. question that or pick up on that, you're welcome to. Yes, thank you. Well, I think you said one key word, which is uh, thrive for objectivity. I don't think there's perfect objective. You know, I, I just know, having been a journalist for 15 years, whenever you write an article, even if you try to present all sides, by selecting how you write about it, you're always in some way, you know, if not taking sides, but p putting a certain point of view on the, on, on the topic that you report upon. But thriving for being as objective as uh, possible, that, that I think is a good, um, is a good principle. Thank you. I do not think that we 
uh, have to fight in quotation uh, for objectivity. If you have such huge amount of information, so it's normal that you try to choose it and select uh, uh, them subjectively with, through your point of view. It's normal. Only tell us. What's your point of view? That's all. Uh, from what kind of value system you decided to have a look on such and such situation in this way. That's all. So I will not be under the, some kind of pressure that there is a chance to be objective. One comment under the line, uh, after the Second World War, when there was a Congress of phys uh, phys Physicians, uh, after Hiroshima and Nag Nagasaki, uh, they put on the table the question if there is a chance, uh, value neutral uh, science, if there is a chance to be objective without ethic, without valuation of consequences. And the answer is no. It's impossible. So, okay, you have your value system, you have your principles, you have your understanding of the world, and through these, you are selecting somehow uh, the information and giving us your understanding of the world. That's all, and I don't think it's tragedy or something wrong. The only thing is on us, how we will uh, behave according to this amount of information and different subjective point of, points yeah. of view. Agree, agree. We have to be free to make our... Yes, we have to be educated, okay. first exactly. of all. <laughs> Next question. There. There. Yeah, there. Uh, just please wait for the micro is coming. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you really think that CNN and other mainstream mass media are objective, that they are providing true information I was very surprised by the answer of the Council for Czech TV when I was complaining and I, I was, you know, discussing the funding of Al Qaeda. I think that today's support of Al Qaeda in Syria and other countries, those massacres in Syria, well, there was certain support from the very beginning and actually the United States were supporting it and the council told me they don't know anything about it, like Mr. Uhde and others told me they don't know anything about that. And it was my pr impression that since they are following CT, Czech TV, that they don't know anything about the problem and they are taking over news from Reuters and other agencies and they don't know anything about that either. So I had to, you know, send links about Hillary Clinton speaking about that, that US sponsored Al Qaeda and Obama spoke about the fact that they are right now discussing it, how it is with those arms for rebels. So that was my question. People who have only information from the internet knew about it. And the Council for the Czech TV, a body which should provide for objective and balanced information without censorship into the Czech TV broadcasting, doesn't know about these issues. And then politicians do not know that either. And they are sending our armed forces within the NATO framework to war. And it seems to me that those news from BBC are not objective, from Reuters, etc. I don't think that anyone from the panel ever claimed that it's objective. You know, you have to put together the faceted picture of the truth. And the more information you have, the more it depends on subjective decision on any media, what to do with the information, with the news, 
how to handle it, where to put it. You cannot expect that one mass media will bring something which could be proudly called a complex truth. What you get is a mosaic of truth, which is combined with an amount of manipulation and lies. Well, you know, I have a much broader possibility. I have the internet, so I have many resources. And when I see that the Czech TV is just picking up pieces, bits and pieces, and they never take into consideration those links and references, what should we do with this censorship? Of, of BBC or CNN or Czech television. I may ask just Adrian which sources uh, you, you use the, 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 uh, the, the Nova for, for the news coverage. There are many, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. All the sources, including those ones which you are uh, using in internet. At the end of the day, somebody has to give you an answer, so I'll try to give it to you. If you'll get a translation uh, here phone. It's about the truth. So if you can believe in CNN or in BBC, my answer is believe as much as you feel comfortable. Media today, due to this unbelievable democratization, which is internet, is good as long as it matches our values and agenda, or is trustful as long as it matches our, uh, our agenda. And we generally believe not so much in media brands, but in people. So probably you will not believe in a reporter who tells you in Syria that in Syria things happen not as you think it happened because you have more, more information than he or she wants to reveal on that certain report. That's okay. That doesn't mean the channel itself, the, the brand itself is not to be trust, uh, trusted. It's, it's just a matter of your choice. And when I said in the beginning, we should trust media, we have no choice but to trust media, it's because we have choices today, which people in some countries didn't have in the past and still don't have today. Adria, thank you. They were the closing words of our panel. Thank you very much. I thank you, of course, Dendlin, Professor Radicheva, Adrian, Franek. Thank you very much and thank you for everything.